have to do with what we see. And that's on purpose. Because I think that what we see helps us determine what we do. How many of you agree with that? What you see determines what you do. And just for Larry, I'm going to tell you that it isn't necessarily what we see with our eyes. You know, we're surrounded with people. Look around. I made sure Larry got to sit next to somebody so he wouldn't be there by himself. Yeah. Everyone has their way of seeing, don't they? Have you ever been in a room and you go, oh, there's that so-and-so over there. They are the biggest skeptic in the world. They are skeptical about this. They are skeptical about that. They are skeptical about this, and sometimes they're skeptical about even more of that. It's true, isn't it? You know skeptics. They don't believe anything. You can tell them the moon is blue, and they'll tell you, no, it's green. There's a skeptic everywhere you turn, it seems. But those aren't the only people sitting near you in this room today, is it? Not just a few skeptics, but... But maybe, just maybe, there are those who see with eyes of the pessimist. Oh, it will never work out. Oh, it can't ever work the way I want it. Oh, why do all these bad things happen to me? Well, that is a whiner, but that's also the pessimist because they come to think that they can't have life any other way. Now, sometimes just as annoying as the pessimists, though, are those lousy optimists out there. Oh, the world is great. It's fabulous, wonderful. And you all know that it's not really. <laughs> we all know that there are people out there speaking words of optimism and, and joy when their lives are a mess and they really need a prayer, perhaps, or a hug. Or to be told that it really will be okay. Oh, then there's this one. Then the, there is this set of eyes out there. And I'm going to go way out on a limb and say that none of you are one of these. How come so many of you just looked and you don't even know what it is and you looked at your neighbor? No. There's the one with the eyes of the critic who can find fault with everything even when it's perfect. Like I said, none of you are ever a critic, but you know a few, don't you? Even when things are good, things aren't good enough. Even when things are smooth, you know, just a little more. You know, there was, there, there was a, a story or a statement that, you know, most people look through their own pair of glasses. And they see the world like they want. And one great writer posed it this way when talking about optimists and those who can always see the good things as people who were looking through rose-colored glasses. But not us. We never look through rose-colored glasses, do we? We never look through anybody's glasses but our own. Isn't that true? Well. I want to suggest there is one pair of glasses you could put on and, and, and 
I have one of those pairs of glasses right up here in a drawer. I'm going to get it for you because I think you all would really love to have a pair of glasses like mine that make the world seem so very wonderful. Here. Here. Let him hold him. Here. Okay, now I'm going to put him back on. Okay. These are my Jesus glasses. Wouldn't you like to have a pair of Jesus glasses? How would you see the world if you were wearing Jesus glasses? I don't know. Jesus glasses. What does it mean to see with Jesus glasses? Well, I think what I want you to understand is that this means seeing the world with the eyes of Jesus. Because you see, as Christians, this is how we're called to see. It's really easy to be the critic, and it's easy to be the pessimist, and it's easy to be the one who 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 just is out there all by themselves. But Scripture, both, the, both of the readings today, talk about seeing with the eyes of God, seeing with the eyes of Jesus. And, and there's this terrible parable in Matthew chapter 25. This parable that says, if you don't see the world with the eyes of Jesus, then perhaps you'll miss the best gift of all. He goes to great lengths, Jesus does, in this parable to talk about how we're called to live life seeing the world as Jesus does. So who does Jesus call us to see the world as? He says, see the world as the hungry, and the thirsty. See the world with needs. See the world with eyes that notice when life isn't right. You see, when we see the world with the eyes of Jesus, it isn't necessarily just about physical hunger or physical thirst that he's talking about there. For people are hungry for the word of God. People are hungry for grace and hope and love and mercy and compassion. People live their lives looking for hope. And if we don't see the world with the eyes of Jesus, then it's likely we won't feed them dinner and we won't even feed their souls. But it wasn't just for hunger and thirst Jesus said to look for, was it? He said, look for those people who are lonely in our world. There are lonely people sitting next to you in this very room. There are lonely people that, that you work with and, and play with and dine with and and, and maybe even in your own families, there are lonely people whose hearts are breaking because there's been no touch. We see them on Sunday morning and we put on that Sunday morning look where we're all fine and happy and good and, and you come in the door. And we've already talked about this a couple of different times in a couple of different sermons. People come in and say, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm wonderful. God's blessed me. It's so great. And their lives are really headed straight down the tubes. Far be it that we could trust our church people enough to tell them. So Jesus says, when you see the lonely, reach out. Reach out and touch someone. But you'll never see them without the eyes of Jesus. And there's one more classification, I think, in this story that, that Jesus gives us. And, and, and I have to tell you that it's, 
it's really hard because Jesus says, look out for those who are in prison. Well, now, how many of you even know somebody who's in prison? So how can you see them? Oh, and I'm not talking about a penitentiary, by the way. They're included, of course. But what about those who are imprisoned by their debt or imprisoned by their addiction or imprisoned by their attitude or they're imprisoned by the way they think? Jesus says, go and visit them and set them free. Remember when Jesus was baptized and then he went to the first place, his hometown, and, and, and they gave him the prophet Isaiah to read and he says, I've come to set the people free. Well, we can't do that if we're not looking at the world with Jesus' shaded glasses. People wonder, and, 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 and I know that sometimes people get tired of hearing us talk about the, the, the streetlight outreach mission and ministry, but quite frankly, we, we who go are so excited about that because we're seeing the hungry get fed, the thirsty get a drink of water. Yesterday, we gave away a lake. It's what it really felt like. We gave away 36 gallons of water. 36 gallon jugs of water. Two 40 bottle cases of water and two 28 or 24 cases of water. 144 bottles of water. And it wasn't enough. But amazingly, the last woman. She had been through the line. She had, had collected whatever it was she collected from us. And she had gone back to her tent. And as we were folding up the tables and closing up the shop, so to speak, she wandered back over there and asked, if there was any water or ice left. And for the first time ever, we realized that we had given away every single thing. And we said, no, we're sorry, there's no more water. We wish we had some more to give. And she said, that's okay. I've already been blessed. And thank you. The eyes of Jesus are eyes that we can all have. I've been touched because... For the last five weeks, we've had one of our young people going on the mission team with us. And last, last Saturday, we were on our way home, and we often debrief in the cars, asking, what did we learn today? What did we hear today? And I'm going to ask Tony to come stand up here. Put on your Jesus glasses for me, will you? He's got Jesus glasses. His are... Not nearly as cool as mine. <laughs> this is for you. I already have one. So, Tony, would you tell the congregation what you told us when we asked, what did you or have you learned in this process? Um, last week I was asked what I thought about helping and why I other people, or more people, didn't help. And I told them that it's easy to help, okay. but a lot of people don't do it because 
they're scared to face the reality that's going on in their community. People turn a blind eye to the problems in their town because they don't want to live in a town where there's turmoil and fear and problems like the tent city. But people need to learn to overcome that because whether you turn a blind eye or not, the problem exists and it's getting worse. So, yeah. Thank you. I want you to understand something. Tony doesn't relish living, being up in front of people like this. It's kind of scary to him. But if you watch him handing out water, if you watch him handing out sandwiches, if you watch him doing whatever it is, we, he's young, we make him do some of the heavy toting. He doesn't have to come. But I know for at least five weeks he's been there. Ten weeks in a row. I'm pretty sure as a teenager he could find something else to do with his Saturday afternoon. So thank you, Tony, for investing, and thank you for sharing that one statement about it being easy to help once you decide. Thank you. Okay. I have a video. And it poses a question. Whose eye do you want to be seen by? The eyes of Jesus or the eyes of the world? And how do you want to be seen? It has been a great day at church, and the blessings of the Lord have been plentiful. Now go and love people with the love of Jesus.
Let us pray. O oh God, you have called us.